It's my pleasure to introduce um, today's first speaker, Franziska Yankov from Munster, who will speak on decidability and definability in unramified Henselian value fields. Remember, if you um, <clears throat> if you have questions, you can put them in chat, um, and I'll try to relay them to the to the speaker. Okay, thank you, Francisco. Uh, thank you very much, and um, thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak today. So I will um, tell you some very classical and some slightly newer results about decidability and definability in unramified Hanselian value fields. And so the first I want to do today is to recall something I guess most of you will know, or all of you will have heard of. Um, so this is the classical results for unramified and serial valued fields. So throughout the talk, I will use the following notation, k, v is a valued field. I will write kv for the residue field and vk for the value group. And now we call a valued field k, v of mixed characteristic unramified um, if the value of p, so of course, if the characteristic is mixed, that means um, p is in the maximal ideal and the value of p is something strictly positive. Um, so if the value of p is, in fact, the minimum positive element in the value group. And of course, for example, um, the piadics with a piadic valuation are an example of um, an unramified valued field, but of course, but also the rationals with a piadic valuation. Now, the very classical theorem by Excursion and Yezhov says that if you have um, two unramified Hanselian valued fields, KV and LW with perfect residue fields, and let me call, so the residue fields are KV respectively LW, then this theorem says that the valued fields are elementarily equivalent, KV, elementarily equivalent to LW if and only if the residue fields are elementarily equivalent and the value groups are elementarily equivalent. And here I mean um, the elementary equivalence in the language of valued fields, which for me, for the sake of this talk, is the language of rings together with a unary predicate interpreted as a valuation ring. And for the residue fields, I just mean as rings, and um, for the value group, I mean in the language of order to be in groups. So um, I'm going to sketch the proof, even though um, I assume that most of you will have seen it, because um, I want to point to you somehow, well, one method to prove it, and very explicitly point to you where the assumption of perfectness of the residue field comes in. So, um, well, the direction from left to right is fairly obvious because um, the residue field and the value group are interpretable in the valued field. And they're uniformly interpretable, of course. I mean, okay, so the other direction, how does it go? So we're assuming the residue fields are elementarily equivalent in the language of rings and the value groups are elementarily equivalent in the language of order to be in groups. And so we take ultra products of these valued fields. I mean, so we have two valued fields satisfying these um, side conditions and we take two ultra products to ensure that, well, first of all, my valued fields are Aleph one saturated. And secondly, um, the 
residue fields are actually isomorphic and so are the value groups. And we can do that using the kiesler schellach theorem. Okay, um, so now what does, um, what do I learn from my evaluation being unramified, right? This means V of P is the smallest positive element in the value group. And this means the convex subgroup generated by the value of P is isomorphic to the integers. And whenever I have a convex subgroup of my value group, I have a corresponding coarsening. So in this case, um, let V hat respectively W hat denote well the coarsening corresponding to the value group um, to, to the convex subgroups of, of the integers, namely, you can also say this is the finest proper coarsening of V respectively W. So then I get a picture like this. Here I have my um, fields K and L with residue fields KV and LW, and by assumption, the residue fields are isomorphic. And now um, the residue field of the finest proper coarsening sits in the mid middle somewhere, where, right where um, this from K to KV hat is the place where V hat with residue field KV hat here, valuation W hat with residue field LW hat. And here I get an induced valuation. Here, sorry. Here I get an induced valuation V bar and W bar on um, the respective, right, the valuation which V bar induces on the coarsening V hat. And now what happens is that these middle fields K V hat with the induced valuation V bar and the same for LW hat is still unramified, right? The value group is Z in this, I mean, really is Z because that's the convex subgroup I've taken. So value group isomorphic to Z with, well, the V bar value of P still being one and um, is complete. Um, why is it complete? Well, that's just because um, by Aleph one saturation um, for this value group, uh, for, for the valuation V bar, I get spherically complete this, namely that every um, countable intersection of balls contains um, an element which implies completeness. Okay, so now a very classical fact, um, I guess, originally claimed by Hasse and Schmidt, though apparently their proof didn't quite work and needed a remedy by McLean and alternatively proved by Teichmüller and Witt in the same journal, so in the same issue of the same journal. So it says that there is a unique such object. So given a perfect field little k of characteristic p positive, there is an unramified complete discrete, by discrete I just mean value group isomorphic to z, valued field, well the vit rings, uh, or the field of vit vectors, w of k, let me denote the valuation on it by v index k, now with residue field little k. And in fact, so this construction was done by Hasse, Hasse and Schmidt, and what Teichmüller and Witt more or less simultaneously proved is that this field, this valued field, is unique up to unique isomorphism. So back in my picture, right, this tells me because the middle layer, this middle layer, 
is just something of rank one discretely valued over the corresponding residue fields um, and it's complete by saturation, I get that, I, that there's also an isomorphism between the middle layers. Okay, and so what am I left with? Well, because the convex subgroup I've divided out by, um, I want to say the, the middle layer, which is now marked in well, whatever, turquoise, um, that's that has characteristic zero because what I've divided out by is exactly um, the convex subgroup generated by P. So um, with respect to the V hat valuation, the value of P is zero. So um, what I'm saying is the characteristic of K comma K V hat is the same as the characteristic of L comma L W hat is zero zero. And what do I know? Well, I know the residue fields L W hat and KV hat are isomorphic, but I also know that the value groups are isomorphic because I've started with two big isomorphic groups VL and WL, and I've quotiented the same Z out of both of them. So I still get V hat K is isomorphic to W hat L. So the um, excursion Yezhov principle and characteristic zero, zero, as we know and love it, tells us that these valued fields K with a V hat valuation and L with a double hat your hat valuation are elementarily equivalent. So write this proof method going via, that's the proof method somehow going via coarsening, and I believe was first done by Cochin. So um, am I done now? No, not quite, right? Because the conclusion I want is that KV is elementarily equivalent to L comma W. So I, um, what you still need to do is to use sort of the following standard trick by Julia Robinson to define an unramified Hensilian valuation. So if K comma V is Hensilian and unramified, then the valuation ring OV is already definable in the language of rings, namely via the formula phi of X is there is a y such that y squared is equal to one plus px squared. Well, really this formula only works for p not equal to two. For p equals to two, you need to do something slightly different. For example, you can do y squared minus y is equal to two x squared, I think. Okay. So now, right, this excursion Yezhov principle up here tells me what I'm highlighting now, tells me in particular, the fields are elementarily equivalent as fields in the language of rings. And now with Julia Robinson's definition, I, I get immediately that K comma V is elementarily equivalent to L comma W. And with similar versions of, um, but well, with, with similar arguments, you also get the following versions of this, namely um, what I call the AKE, uh, well, relative model completeness or AKE with um, elementary equivalence as a subscript, namely that you have, if you have an embedding of unramified Hensilian valued fields with perfect residue fields such that this embedding in well this embedding induces an embedding of residue fields such which and if that's an elementary embedding and the same for the value groups vk is elementary in wl then the embedding of valued fields is already 
elementary. So I want to say you can prove this in a similar way, though it's um, um, but the argument is more complicated, but you can also use it, prove it using this coarsening method. Then um, I guess um, I'm attributing this to pass. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I think you can deduce this from pass's work and from no one before him, but maybe you can deduce it from excursion Yazov in a way that I'm not aware of, namely that the residue field KV is stably embedded in the value field k comma v as a pure field. So any um, subset of k v to the n, which is definable in the valued field structure and the valued fields language is already definable in the language of rings as a subset field of k v. Um, and finally, a result by Belair, which says that if KV, the residue field is NIP, then also the valued field is NIP in a similar way to um, write Delon's proof for, of the same fact for equicharacteristic zero. Okay. So throughout all this, we've had the assumption that the residue field be perfect. So what I want to go through with you today, or what I want to um, discuss today is how about imperfect residue fields. Any questions so far? Still unmodified? Yes, yes. I want to sort of ask the same questions for unramified, but now with imperfect residue fields. But does this change if you only allow finite ramification? Or? Ah, well, I'll also talk about finite ramification at the end. So I'll first talk about unramified and imperfect residue field, and then I'll talk about um, arbitrary residue field and finite ramification. At least a bit. Um, okay, so, uh, and what I'm presenting is joint work with Sylvie Anscombe, unless I'm crediting it otherwise, of course. So, the key ingredient somehow was this, um, in the previous proof, was the fact that there is this unique object um, for th this unique complete um, valuation ring with a given, well, unramified with a given residue field. So what, um, so the existence of such, such an object, again, was claimed by Hasse and Schmidt, and I believe you need something from the claim to actually make it work, but it says that given a field K of characteristic positive, there is in an unramified discretely valued field, um, let me for now call it C of K comma VK um, with residue field little K. And we call this, oh, well, this is called um, a Cohen field over little k. So the existence is just the same as for perfect residue fields. And in fact, also, so that's um, something which Cohen showed in 46, namely any two Cohen fields, which of course he didn't call Cohen fields, but they've been called so since, over little k are isomorphic. The big difference to the um, um, perfect residue field case is that they are not isomorphic via a unique isomorphism anymore. However, when you look up to our proof, the proof I sketched at the beginning, 
right? We only needed the existence of a, I mean, given a isomorphism of the residue fields, we needed the existence of an isomorphism um, between the corresponding sort of turquoise part, the, the complete um, valued fields in the middle. So what I'm saying is uh, the exclusion Yezhev principle for imperfect residue fields just go through with the proof I presented above as um, before. So if you have two Henselian unramified valued fields and you get immediately that the valued fields are elementarily equivalent in the language of valued fields, if and only if the residue fields are elementarily equivalent in the language of rings and the value groups are elementarily equivalent in the language of ordered abelian groups. So, um, yeah, right. Right, so uh, for this, we really needed um, just uniqueness up to isomorphism of the corresponding discrete, unramified, complete valued fields. Note, though I've written this in a functorial way, C of k, comma, vk, that's no longer fun functorial. I mean, this is no longer rigid. But what I, what I mean by rigid is um, for the construction with perfect residue fields, you actually have that, right, yeah, for a given copy of your residue field, there is only one, I mean, canonically, there's only one object over it. So there is only one automorphism of the valued field, which fixes the residue field point-wise. This is not true anymore over imperfect residue fields. So um, if you want to, um, in order to reprove these other classical results, which I mentioned, namely um, excursion years of elementary embedding or stable embeddedness of the residue field or NIP transfer. So in order to understand the other classical results, um, we need to understand well, the automorphisms. of CK fixing little k, right? I mean, somehow the way I've written, I've denoted this is to write it C of K as, right? That's, that's misleading a bit because it looks as if there was a canonical object. So from now on, I'm just going to talk about complete discrete unramified valued fields with a given residue field. And I'm going to call them C comma V, where V is always a valuation with my specified residue field. So what do I need to fix in order to make things rigid? Well, um, I mean, somehow in an obvious manner, we need to think about P basis of the residue field. So, well, if I have a P basis of my residue field, I can, I can of course pull it um, by taking a section of the residue map, basically, I can pull it up into my complete discrete valued field. So um, what I want to say is, if I take a P basis, beta of my field little k, then I call a map S from beta to C, um, such that if I apply S to an element of B, so I get something in the Cohen field and then take the residue of it, it's B again. So such a map, so for all B in beta, 
what is called a map of representatives in an obvious way. Um, Okay, and the secret is that's what we need to know. So um, Cohen proved in his 46 paper, building on what he calls the Teichmüller embedding process, that once you know a map of representatives, you can build the entire Cohen ring from it or the entire Cohen field. When I say Cohen ring, I mean the valuation ring of that field. For the valuation ring for the valuation with residue field little k so um what um, cohen's theorem says that if assume again i have a field little k of positive characteristic and take c1 and c2 two cohen fields over the field uh, over this residue field little k let beta subset of k be a p-basis and si from beta into ci for i equals 1, 2 be maps of representative. Then there is a unique isomorphism of valued fields. Phi from C1 to C2, which commutes with these maps of representatives. So that means um, which way around is it if I do S1 first and then phi, yeah, it's the same as S2. Oh, um, On the yeah? What is the added information when the ready to be perfect? Yeah, nothing. Sorry? then it's nothing right because a p basis is just um well however you want to define a p basis but maybe a p basis is just given by one so then yeah, yeah. Uh, really if the residue field is perfect right um yeah. the, 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 there are i mean these maps of representatives are trivial so you recreate the um the uniqueness up to um unique isomorphism. I mean, you get the uniqueness up to a unique isomorphism. Okay, so using Cohen, I mean, using this um, Cohen structure theorem, as we call it, you can now get, well, you can't quite do the, let me check, check what the chat says, whether there's a question. Yeah, when the field is perfect, the, the p-basis is empty. I never know whether the p-basis is empty or whether it consists of one element. I... Yeah. So um, you can't quite, I mean, for, for AKE elementary embedding, I guess, depending, I mean, as long as you do a proof along the lines of the AKE elementary equivalence, yeah, you, you need to work harder than for um, than for the perfect residue field case because you need to you need to take slightly more care. But I mean, you just get the same result as before. So if you have two unramified Hanselian valued fields such that um, the induced embedding of I mean one contained to the other such that the induced embedding of residue fields is elementary and the induced embedding of value groups is elementary, then KV is in fact elementary 
in LW. And so, I mean, in order to, to prove that, right, what you need to do is um, to, to make sure that this elementary embedding statement is, you can turn it into something about automorphisms, but you can. Um, you also get stable embeddedness. So KV is stably embedded in K comma V as a pure field. So previously, right, when I said stable embeddedness followed from Pass's theorem, and no one, none of you has yet given me a better reference than Pass, I, um, right, it was about relative quantifier elimination. Now here, you don't have relative, quant oh, well, um, you don't necessarily have relative quantifier elimination anymore, or I don't, well, I don't want to claim it, at least not today. Let's put it like this. Um, so, um, but still you can, I mean, you can show stable embeddedness of the residue fields as, um, as an, um, via an automorphism argument in an, uh, right, showing that in a sufficiently saturated model of your theory, automorphisms from the residue field lift to automorphisms on the valued field. And um, you show that more or less using exactly the same trick as before, namely you, you lift them up by rank one and then, um, well, maybe you lift them up by stable embeddedness in equicharacteristic zero, although that doesn't quite work because you're not necessarily saturated anymore, but it, it, there's a question in the chat of, um, do you also have stable embeddedness of the value group? So yes, you do. And it's, I, I mean, I think what works is that, I mean, the, the statement is, yeah, for any, um, yeah, certainly VK is stably embedded as a pure ordered Debian group. But in order to prove that, um, I mean, the, the, if you give an automorphism argument of that, that's no different um, for imperfect or perfect. I mean, that doesn't depend on the residue field at all. That's what I want to say, but yes. So that's also true. And we also get the NIP transfer statement. And this is maybe I should say, this is really why um, Sylvia and I started looking at uh, the model theory of cone fields at all, because we wanted to get, well, we wanted to find out whether there are um, Hensilian valued NIP fields with imperfect residue fields. And we thought, well, there should be, but in order to prove that we need some kind of NIP transfer theorem. And of course, for, um, right, in, for a, um, NIP field of positive characteristics, since we know it to be Artin Schreier closed, unless it's finite, um, the residue fields of all Hensilian valuations on it, well, of all valuations on it, in fact, are perfect. So um, the only examples of imperfect residue fields are exactly of those kinds, are um, Hensilian valued fields unramified or finitely ramified with imperfect residue fields, which is, um, which are NIP. So um, what I want to say is KV NIP implies K comma V NIP. And here you very much can't use the Belair argument anymore, but you want to prove it using the um, proof methods done first by Chernikov and Hills, where they prove NTP2 transfer um, via well, sort of properties they call um, understanding immediate extensions and stable embeddedness. So that's exactly, so stable embeddedness, right, is the point before him. This is why I was, in, or why we were interested in stable embeddedness and controlling immediate extensions is very easy in complete or is entirely possible in 
well, with incomplete discrete valued fields. And that's again at the heart of it. So an example for this now that I talked about um, Hensilian NIP fields with NIP and serial valued fields with imperfect residue fields. So you take somehow KV a separably closed field, which is not perfect. So whatever, FPT sep, that's of course NIP. And so um, any, now I, I write it in the functorial way again, but any Cohen field over that is NIP. Of course, also with evaluation, because the valuation is zero definable by the Julia Robinson trick I showed you at the beginning of the talk. Okay, that's what I wanted to say about unramified Hensilian value fields. Do you want, I mean, are there questions before I go on to finitely ramified Hensilian value fields? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, what about doing all of this after you name a substructure? Because this should be, I don't know, just more equivalent to the elimination of quantified examples. I mean, take a substructure and name it, then do this act caution L shop and so on and so on. I mean, yeah, the, the, the question is what precisely, do, I mean, do you want to name any substructure? Yeah, you should name it. Constance. Add constance. Yeah. Ah, you want to add constants? Yeah, adding constants is something which doesn't go well with decidability in general. Right? There are um, decidable fields which have a finite extension which is undecidable. No, but I'm. Okay. Maybe I didn't understand the question. Also, I can't hear you very well yet here. Oh, sorry. I mean, okay. I, I hear you cutting in and out, so I'm I'm vaguely guessing what you said. Oh no, I, I'm saying that we, we can discuss it later. Okay, but, uh, but I'm saying naming a substructure, not naming. Not naming constants. But and Yeah, I don't think there is anything wrong. I mean, yeah, that something will go wrong if you name a substructure. What I'm saying is this should be at least somehow equivalent to what we said before that we wanted to eliminate field quantifiers. Then to ah. show that means at least go. Ah, case. yes, yes, you can name a substructure and eliminate field quantifiers. I, yeah, I think you're right. I would, I, I'm. Sylvie and I are still trying to understand what the best language is to eliminate field quantifiers in. Let's put it like this. And um, we've had many languages, but still we're not satisfied to having found the right one with a capital R somehow. So that's why I'm not talking about quantifier elimination because we still, still feel we've not yet reached what we want to prove. Um, so let me say something about finite ramification. Um, let me define first what finite ramification means, although I assume that most of you will know it. So uh, a, a valued field of mixed characteristic is called finitely ramified if the interval between zero and the value of P in the value group well, it's finite. So there's only finitely many elements which positive value, but value less or equal to P. So um, in order to describe the, the theory of a finitely ramified field, we will certainly need to fix um, the degree, I mean, the number of elements which are between zero and the value of phi, P. So. That's called the degree, I mean, that's the degree of ramification. E, well, which is a positive natural number. And what I mean by is, is I, E, um, the value between Z, zero and the value of P, this interval has E, 
many elements. So um, what's well known without any further assumptions is that elementary equivalence, the excursion Yezhev theorem for elementary equivalence fails. So um, EG, you take two quadratic extensions of Q3, say these two, um, they are distinct. They have different algebraic part, right? They have, a, they have different theories as well. They're both extensions of QP, or of Q3, sorry, with E equals to two, right? And they, well, in an obvious way, the residue field because the value group, right, they're, they're, they're quadratic extensions. So if I, if the, by the fundamental equality in discrete valued fields, I get um, the residue fields must still be F3, but you can also very easily check it. And of course the value group is isomorphic to Z because it's a finite extension of Q3. Um, but, it, but of course, I mean, as I said, they have different algebraic parts, right? So um, Q3 joint square root of three is not elementary equivalent to Q3 joint square root of six. Um, so in order to, to understand elementary equivalence, you need to talk about, you, ne you need to add constants. Um, what I want to show you now is that also for um, finite ramification, stable embeddedness of the residue field fails or may fail. So in order to do that, I take, um, well, for, the, for what I find the easiest example, I take an extension of FP by two algebraically independent elements alpha one and alpha two algebraically independent. And this is my residue field. I mean, this I will take as my residue field. And of course, now there exists a sigma, I write sigma bar because it's an automorphism on the residue field in odd K, which exchanges alpha one and alpha two. Alpha sigma of alpha, sigma bar of alpha one is equal to alpha two. We also write sigma bar of alpha two is equal to alpha one. So now I take an unramified Hanselian valued field KV with that given residue field, and I take an A1 in K um, with residue field uh, with residue exactly this first element, say alpha one. And now I look at the finite extension of K, which is finitely ramified, namely I adjoin a square root of PA1. So this gives me, right, this gives me um, an extension of ramification degree two because yeah, well, PA1 is an element of value one and it now has a root. And of course, um, so V, is an serial evaluation, so it extends uniquely. So this is in a canonical way a valued field to L, um, L comma V is finitely ramified. The residue field is still K and the extension of the value groups value groups is of degree two. And so the ramification degree is two. And then you check, then L contains no square root of P of A1, 
of p times a, sorry, of p times a2, where a2 is any lift of alpha 2. And that's because uh, alpha 1 and alpha 2 are algebraically independent. And you can deduce that from alpha 1 and alpha 2 being algebraically independent. What you need them to be is into two different square classes in little k. So um, I claim that hence sigma bar does not lift to sigma to an automorphism sigma of L. I guess in the interest of time, right, you, you just work it out. I mean, otherwise, if you take a sigma which would lift sigma bar, then, well, in fact, it would send P A1 to, um, it, it, it would send the square root of P A1 to a square root of P A2. You just work it out. And note that, I mean, this example works just as well with perfect residue fields. I mean, you can give a similar example with perfect resolution. Yeah, it's on the ring and thing. Um, so you think all is lost. However, we can still prove that if you can still prove NIP transfer. So if KV is finitely ramified. There's a question of whether it would suffice to add constants. Yes, I mean, okay, in, yes, I think it suffices to add constants. Yes, sorry, I didn't see the question. Um, no, you, you need to add constants for um, a, um, yeah, for, I guess, for the coefficients of an Eisenstein polynomial. Um, So for NIP transfer, we can prove nonetheless that if you have a finitely ramified Hensilian valued field, then if KV is NIP, then the valued field is NIP. That's just because, well, um, a complete discretely valued finitely ramified um, Valued field is always a finite extension of a complete unremified Hensilian valued field over the same residue field. And now, of course, if um, if the smaller field is NIP by the NIP transfer theorem for unremified Hensilian valued fields, then the bigger field, which is interpretable in the smaller field, is still NIP. And um, well, I guess that's really why we try to. But why we tried for quite a while to prove stable embeddedness of the residue field as a pure field. And when we failed, we realized, well, it's because it doesn't hold, but the NIP transfer, which we're interested in, still holds. And um, interestingly, the AKE um, model completeness or elementary equivalence also still holds. And um, I'm sure someone must have recorded that for perfect residue field somewhere. I just don't know where. So I can't, uh, yeah. I guess I can't um, correctly attribute it. So if you have um, two finitely ramified Hensilian valued fields, well, Hensilian of the same ramification degree. E positive, um, then, well, you get what you think. If the residue fields are elementarily, sit elementarily in each other and the value groups do too, then the same works for the value field. Okay, that's what I wanted to tell you. I welcome any questions. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions?
um, I, I also question. take comments. Oh, I was wondering, um, maybe this is a dumb question. Are there simple examples of imperfect NIP fields other than separably closed fields? Um, yeah, because, I mean, you can start, I mean, I guess you, you start with a separably closed field and you turn it, you take this as your um, you take this as your residue field of an algebraically maximal Kaplansky field, right? So you take whatever a power series field over it with p divisible value group. And then you can still insert that as your residue field. And I guess we believe that should be all. I mean, Wait, I thought you said then that our conjecture tells us that should be all. I thought that you said that if a field is positive characteristic, then if it's like equi characteristic P, then the residue in its Zellian, then the residue field is not is that is perfect. Yes, I um yeah, you're right, I said that. And um yeah, so I um no but um sorry, I said that and um but there are sorry, there are separably algebraically maximal non- they're, they're, okay, I um, you're right, and no, I said it wrong. So there are separably algebraically maximal non-perfect valued fields which are not separably closed, with then algebraically closed residue field. Can I give an example? I'm not sure. I guess. Yeah, but they exist. I think about an example. Are there any other questions? Somehow the point is by this, um, they can uh, at most, I mean, on an NIP field, there can at most be one Hensilian valuation with imperfect residue field. And in this case, it must be the the cause is one of mixed characteristic and it must come out of a cosming with value group z i mean it must come out of a middle part with value group z so let's uh let's thank francisco again for a wonderful talk and thank you for listening